Jaguar. It's a sports car brand, isn't it? They make a few saloon cars and the odd estate, but generally they just make sporty little things, don't they? Well, that changed in 2016 because they launched the F-Pace and that was their first ever SUV. And now there's a new baby Jag. No, that's not journalistic speak. There really is a new baby Jag. Look, the windscreen says so. Ah, cute, isn't it? This is the E-Pace. Jaguar is positioning the car as the cup of the range. And while the E-Pace name might imply it's electric, it most definitely isn't. There's a range of petrols and diesels available, and it goes up against the Volvo XC40, BMW X1, the Audi Q3, and the Jaguar's sister car, the Range Rover Evoque. In fact, the E-Pace shares quite a bit with the Range Rover, and it's not necessarily a good thing, as we shall find out. Inside in the E-Pace's interior is more related to the F-Type sports car than is the F-Pace SUV because it takes key design cues from the F-Type like this grab handle that wraps down to the centre console and these ventilation controls here. Quality wise, well it's okay in places and quite disappointing in others. I have to say, like across the top of the doors, this all feels very good and squidgy and the same goes across the dash as well. But the bad, well this plastic around the infotainment screen and around the starter button. I mean, this is something you're going to be touching every single day and listen to this. That's really very nasty indeed. Now, every single car has Jaguar's widescreen infotainment system. It uses Jag's in-control system. It looks good, but the functionality isn't the best, I have to say. And it do still doesn't have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's also quite steeply raked. So when the sun comes through the windscreen, you sometimes you can't see the stuff on the dashboard. There are some nice design cues in here. Probably my favourite is if you lift up the armrest and you lift up the cup holders. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. You can see that the pad down here. You know, can you see what that is? That's Jaguar skin, isn't it? Now, let me pop this back in and talk to you about storage because this is where the E-Pace gets really quite exciting if you like storage. Because, of course, you've got two cup holders here. That's the second bottle. There's a space here for your mobile phone. Or if you don't want to put it there, you can slot it down there. But if I lift up these two bottles and I take this tray out like I did earlier on and stick that down there, I can fit one, two, three, four, five water bottles. Now, you have to admit that is pretty impressive, isn't it? Now, talking of storage, there is a massive door bin down here. It fits the car buyer large water bottle test easily. I mean, I could probably fit two of those in there. That is quite extraordinary. And elsewhere, well, the glove box is absolutely massive as well. So if you like your storage, you are going to love the Jaguar E-Pace. Round in the back seats, and you'll see that I've brought my trusty water bottle with me. And the reason for that is, surprise, surprise, the door bins back here can fit a large water bottle. Look at that. That's pretty unusual, I have to say. Now, back here, there is quite a lot of space. Considering this car's small dimensions, there is quite a lot of room back here. Now, knee room is pretty good. And despite the fact we've got a glass panoramic roof, headroom is pretty good too. You could probably fit three people back here at a push. I mean, I particularly wouldn't want to be the middle passenger. There's not a huge amount of space here for your bottom, but it can be done if you really need to. Now, there is a little 12 volt uh, socket down there to charge things up. We've got a couple of cup holders here, some more storage. I don't know what you fit in there, a CD. That's where the people take CDs with them anymore. Goodness only knows, but there's some storage there and there's some easily reachable isofix points. The two bad things, well, there is some pretty scratchy plastic here. Can you see that? Now, why on earth am I moaning about that? Well, the reason why I moan about it is because these doors don't open particularly wide. And if you're going to be buying this as a family car, that's not a good thing because you're going to be loading your child seats right against this plastic and it's going to scratch within five minutes of owning this car. I have to say, though, there is one thing I do quite like on this car and it's quite unusual for a small little SUV. And let's face it, an SUV that's probably not going to be going off road that much. And it's the fact that the doors curl all the way under the bodywork and it means that this sill never gets dirty and it means your trousers also never get dirty. 
It's the boot where the E-Pace really pulls ahead of its rivals because when the seats are up, there's more space in there than there is in a BMW X1, an Audi Q2, and this car's sister car, the Range Rover Evoque. Not only is the space good, but the shape is also good as well. It's nice and square, and there's no load lip whatsoever. It's all sounding like good news, isn't it? However, I do have to have a bit of a rant, I'm afraid, because the parcel shelf is made out of the poorest, cheapest quality material I have ever had the displeasure of touching. To think that this is put inside a car that costs from just under £30,000 and goes well into the 40s is frankly unacceptable. However, rant over with. If you want to increase your luggage space, you just press the two buttons on top of the seats, fold those down, and whilst the seat backs don't fold down completely flat, they fold down flat enough, I think you'll agree. And if we grab the car by suitcases, you can see just how much space you've got. And I think you'll agree, that is an awful lot of it. So not only is the E-Pace the top choice if you want a practical little SUV, it's also the top choice if you have a bit of an active lifestyle because you can have Jaguar's activity key. Now what that is, it means that if you're at the beach or something and you don't want to carry your keys on you because there's fear of losing them or getting them wet, you can leave your keys in the car and lock the car with this little wristband. It's quite a nifty little thing. The E-Pace trim range can initially seem a little confusing as it consists of two main pillars, a regular model and an R-Dynamic model. Each pillar contains the same four trim levels, standard, S, SE and HSE, with R-Dynamic versions having a more sporty look. Standard kit includes 17-inch alloys, LED headlights, dual-zone climate control, front and rear parking sensors, a rear-view camera, plus a heated windscreen and that 10-inch infotainment screen. It's the S model you really want though, as it adds larger wheels, electric front seats, leather trim and sat-nav. However, the other models further up the range bump up the price with equipment you could do without. The engine range is a little easier to navigate though. For the time being, there's three 2.0-litre diesels with only the most basic one coming with front-wheel drive and there's also two high-powered petrols. Here we've got the entry-level E-Pace here with its tiny little 2.0-litre engine with 150 horsepower, so it's badged D150. And for the most part, it's an absolutely fine engine. 0 to 62 takes over just 10 seconds. And once up to speed, this is quite a quiet car. There's a bit of wind noise around there, but the diesel engine settles down and there's not a huge amount of tyre noise. However, if you do require a bit of extra oomph from this engine, if you're cruising around 50 miles an hour in sixth gear and you need to overtake something, you do find this engine is lacking a little bit. I mean, if you change down and pin the throttle, waiting, 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 and now we start going. There is quite a bit of turbo lag, which is the reason why I wouldn't go for this engine. I'd actually go for the D180 with 180 horsepower. That, that extra bit of horsepower does really make an impact when you're overtaking. Now for petrols, there's only two, the P250 and the P300. And as you can tell from those numbers, they're quite powerful. They're also mated to four wheel drive and automatic gearboxes and consequently, they're quite juicy and they emit quite a lot of carbon dioxide. So if you do want to go for the petrols, I would recommend going for the P250 because the P300 is just too expensive. Remember I mentioned the Range Rover Evoque earlier on? Well, underneath the E-Pace, it's based on the Evoque, not one of Jaguar's new featherweight platforms. The upshot is the E-Pace is actually heavier than the larger F-Pace SUV. But that weight does mean it feels planted and secure on the road. And you can really feel that weight. Now, most Jaguars, they feel quite light and lithe and, and sort of agile, but this feels quite heavy and quite lumpen through the corners. It's quite a disappointment if you're used to driving a modern day Jaguar. Now, it's not just the weight, you can also feel Jaguars fitted quite heavy suspension. The good part of that is that when you turn into a corner, the body doesn't roll that much, but the 
bad part of that means that around town this does thump into potholes quite badly and on the motorway it never really settles down it always feels quite fidgety now Jaguar do sell you adaptive dampers now if you can afford it I would recommend going for it not only can you adjust the dampers but it also gives you more configuration options when you come to the drive mode select down here on the center console because if you don't have adaptive dampers all this does is adjust the steering weighting and the throttle sharpness. It really does nothing whatsoever and for the most part you just tend to leave it in comfort mode. At least the E-Pace steers nicely though. While it doesn't have the crispness of an F-Pace or one of Jag's saloons, it's probably one of the best in class for steering feel and response. In fact, with so much adjustment in the steering column, it's possible to get a fantastic driving position, which is not only comfortable, but also makes the E-Pace feel more sporty to be in. However, thanks to that sloping roofline and quite a small back window, rear visibility isn't great, and you have to be careful which gearbox you go for. Now you may have noticed this E-Pace has a manual gearbox and I have to say it's the first manual Jaguar, modern day Jaguar, I've ever driven. And I can see why nobody buys manual gearboxes in a Jaguar because this one is absolutely awful. Just please, I implore you, go for the eight-speed automatic. This six-speed manual is so notchy. It doesn't like to be rushed either. And the whole change quality the whole change action just feels very nasty, sticky and notchy. It's very, very unpleasant. And finally, be careful with the options list. The E-Pace starts at just under £30,000 and that's pretty reasonable. But add a few extras to the top models and it's possible to nudge the price up to an eye-watering £60,000. Keep it realistic and you'll end up with a good small SUV with a premium badge and image. While the E-Pace doesn't excel as a Jaguar SUV quite like the F-Pace does and it may have a few rough edges, it's still a desirable little thing that's more than worthy of consideration. If you enjoyed this video, watch our BMW X2 review and our SUVs playlist. Click the Car Buy logo to subscribe to the channel and as ever, thanks for watching.